Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker tonight. It's going to be Neely Steinberg. Where's Neely? Neely's in the back here. Let's hear it for Neely Steinberg. She is a dating coach and image consultant. So I think uh, I'm definitely really interested in what she has to say to see if she can help me out. So uh, we'll see. We've got Eric Jansen. Where's Eric? This is uh, Eric over here. He's over by the wall if we look over that way. Uh, Eric Jansen is uh, one of the men responsible for basically bringing the world of VR and the world of exercise together. And you might notice, by the way, right behind him, we have a stationary bike and a screen up over there. This is, uh, this is one of the products that his company is making, and if you want to try it out, you can. So we got a really, like a working stationary bike and virtual reality situation over there. If you want to try it, go try it. Yeah? Cool? Very cool. And then finally, we've also got Skylar Griggs. She's a registered dietitian. She's going to tell us how to stay healthy while we're all sitting here drinking beer and wine. <laughs> I mean, what could be better? So that's the deal. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to kick things off with our first speaker in just a bit. Are we ready to have a good time? Yes. I believe you. We'll be back shortly. Thanks for being with us. We got our first speaker coming up right now. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what she has to say, and I suspect that uh, everybody will walk away, uh, whether we are single or not, having learned something here, right? Uh, so uh, she is a dating coach, an image consultant, and the founder of something called The Love Trap. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's fine, because I think she's going to explain it to us a little bit. We'll find out by the end of this talk what that is all about. So please welcome to the stage right now, Neely Steinberg. Be the CEO and entrepreneur of your dating and love life. What does that mean to you? Be the CEO and entrepreneur of your dating and love life. Some of you here in the audience tonight may in fact be CEOs. Some of you may be entrepreneurs. Some of you may dream one day of becoming a CEO or starting a business. But I'm sure all of you right now are wondering what on earth is the connection between leading and creating a business venture and leading in and creating in your dating and love life? Three years ago, I left a job as an academic advisor to the MBA students at Babson College, and I was in that office for more than a decade. If you don't know, Babson is considered the number one school for entrepreneurship education in the world. While I was there, I was meeting with thousands of students, many of whom were budding CEOs, budding entrepreneurs. I was going to countless forums and panels and lectures and workshops on entrepreneurship and on becoming a leader. I was reading the books and the journal articles and the magazine articles. I even took the introductory MBA entrepreneurship course. Simultaneously to my career at Babson on the side, I was also doing a lot of interesting things. I had created and hosted an internet TV show on dating and relationships. I had created and hosted two different radio shows on dating and re uh, relationships. And I was freelance writing and blogging a ton on the topics. While I was straddling these two worlds, I realized that there were a ton of really interesting parallels between creating, building, and shaping a thriving, healthy, meaningful business venture and creating, building, and shaping a thriving, healthy, meaningful dating and love life. So what did I do? I became an entrepreneur myself. I started my own dating coaching business. I called it the Love Trep. That's T-R-E-P, which is common shorthand for the word entrepreneur. And I wrote a book called Skin in the Game, Unleashing Your Inner Entrepreneur to Find Love. And I've scattered some copies on the tables here tonight, so if you're interested, have a look. So, without further ado, I am here tonight to offer you four tips on how you can become the CEO and entrepreneur of your dating and love life so that you can create what I think many of us, if not most of us, want in our lives and that is a healthy, happy relationship. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Tip number one. To become the CEO and entrepreneur of your dating and love venture, your dating and love startup, 
you need to have a couple of things. You need to have the desire, and you need to have a vision. Let's start with desire. You have to desire this for yourself. Desire has to come from within you, right? You can't want this because your friends want it for you, or you think it's what you should want, or society wants for you, or your parents want for you, right? You can't want this to get that nagging grandma or aunt off your back, right? Like, when are you going to get married anyway? We, we all have those people in our lives, trust me. I know I did too. You have to desire to create this for yourself. It has to come from deep within, because it's going to be that desire that fuels your action in your venture. And trust me, you're gonna need this desire when inevitably you stumble into roadblocks and setbacks and various challenges in your love life. Your desire is gonna keep you going through the tough times. Let's talk about vision. I think it's really important in this venture of yours to create an overarching vision of what it is you truly desire to create, right? What do you wanna create? What kind of relationship do you wanna have? How do you wanna feel within that relationship? What do you envision the relationship looking like? Now, I don't want you to envision what this person looks like, how tall they have to be, how much hair they have to have on their head, what they do for a living, how exactly you're going to meet them. No, I'm simply asking you to envision a grander, larger, overarching vision for what it is you truly desire to create in your love life. And that's going to be the vision you're working towards creating in your venture. The great John Marthinson, macroeconomics professor at Babson College, once said that the future is not predictable, but it is conceivable. You have to believe in your vision and go after it. Okay. Tip number two, assemble your board of advisors. I'm willing to bet that in every other area of your life, whether it's career, education, health, hobbies, you have, at one point or another, assembled a team of support around you, right? To guide you, advise you, inspire you, encourage you. Yet, for some reason, when it comes to dating, love, relationships, a lot of people think they have to go it alone. Whether it's the embarrassment, shame, stigma of getting help in that area. Yet, relationships is one of the most complicated aspects of the human experience. So this notion that we should have to navigate that path and figure it out all on our own is silly. Get support. I recommend three people for your board of advisors. It'd be great if you could have all three, but any combination is fine, and if you can only have one person, then that's okay too. First person is a therapist. I truly believe in the power of talking, talking, talking to create awareness in your life. Second person is a coach, somebody who's a little bit more action-oriented, right? So it could be a dating, love, relationship, life coach, Right? Someone like me or someone whose message and philosophy you, really resonates with you. In fact, I love when my dating coaching clients are also working with a therapist. I think it's a really powerful combination. Maybe you can't afford a coach. Maybe you can't afford a therapist. At the very least, I want you to have a trusted friend on your board. All right? Somebody who you can turn to on a consistent basis um, for support to talk about what's coming up for you in your dating and love life. The caveat is this friend needs to be in a healthy, happy relationship. Okay? Get the support you need. Assemble your board of advisors. Tip number three, and I call this one the three questions. Len Schlesinger, I'm just gonna call him Len because his last name is like a major tongue twister for me. Um, but Len was a former president of Babson College when I was working there. And he wrote a book that was required reading for all of the MBA students in their introductory entrepreneurship course. And the book is called Action Trumps Everything. And in this book, Len encourages budding entrepreneurs to ask themselves three simple questions to aid them in getting started in their venture. You see, because Len believes that you don't need a million different things to get started, right? You simply need to access the means you have at hand, the knowledge and the resources you already have at hand. I'm going to encourage you to ask yourselves those same three simple questions to aid you in getting started in your dating and love venture. And those questions are, who am I, what do I know, and who do I know? I only, in the interest of time, I only have... I'm only gonna be able to address the first two, but if you wanna know more about who do I know, m copies of my book are here, it's also available on Amazon. I dedicate a whole chapter to that, it's called networking. <laughs> so let's start with, who am I? Who are you? What makes you tick? What really matters to you in life? What do you truly value in life? 
What's your personality like? Who do you think would be a good compliment for you, a good fit for you? Who do you think you would be a good fit for? Really spending time with these questions. A lot of people think they have to change who they are to be in a relationship, right? That they have to hide or tamp down parts of themselves to be worthy of love, to be lovable, to be good enough. I'm here to tell you that that is simply not true. Start developing an appreciation for and a curiosity about the people who like you for you. The people who like you for who you are at your core. And stop chasing the ones who don't and won't and never will. Who are you? Let's talk about what do I know. When it comes to your past experiences in the context of dating, sex, love, relationships, what do you know? What are the lessons you can glean from a lifetime of experiences? What are your fears? What are your insecurities? What are your um, unhealthy patterns, the things you keep doing over and over again, expecting different results, right? They say that's the definition of insanity. What are your limiting beliefs when it comes to men, women, sex, love, dating, relationships, marriage, intimacy, commitment, vulnerability? The list goes on and on. Let's br and do you self-sabotage in your love life and why, right? Let's bring these things, let's identify, unpack, and address these things so that we can bring these things to a place of conscious awareness in our venture. So we're not just stumbling around like that dating zombie, right? Mm, like going through the motions, not knowing why you say what you say, feel what you feel, do what you do, right? A place of conscious awareness so that you can start making more empowered, healthier choices and decisions in your love life. Someone once told me that awareness is 80% of change. What do you know? You know more than you think you do, I promise. Okay, tip number four. Edgar, stay away. <laughs> okay, this is a good one. Failure is your greatest asset. What if you could start to view your failures in your love life differently? What if you could start to view your failures, those things you deem setbacks, mistakes, wrong turns, as assets, as things you can learn and grow from. You know, entrepreneurs especially embrace this concept of failure. In fact, they have a global series of conferences called FailCon, at which they gather to discuss their various defeats. They wear their defeats like badges of honor. What if you could de-educate yourself from this concept of failure as you've always known it? The great Heidi Neck talks a lot about this, right? She says that when we view fear in the traditional sense, we develop a real fear for that part of the experience. And I should mention she's a professor of entrepreneurship at Babson, right? So we develop a real fear for that part of the experience, so we're unwilling to take risks. We're unwilling to step outside our comfort zone. She says, instead, let's view our failures differently as a series of iterations. And that's how I'm going to encourage you to view your quote unquote failures in your dating and love life as a series of iterations that's helping you to grow and shape and build this venture of yours. Failure is your greatest asset. I'm gonna end with a quick story. It's a common motivational story told on the entrepreneurial circuit. So some of you treps in the audience may have heard of it. It's called the two-shoe salesman. And I'm gonna call it the two-shoe salespeople because after all, we are living in the 21st century, right? <laughs> so there's two shoe salespeople and they work at competing shoe companies. And they're sent to a foreign country to assess that market for shoes. First person goes to the foreign country does her market research, goes back to the telegraph office. I suppose this was created when people were sending telegraphs. Sends the following message. Research complete, unmitigated disaster. Nobody here wears shoes. Second person goes to the foreign country, does his market research, goes back to the same telegraph office, sends the following message. Research complete, tremendous success. Nobody here wears shoes. Which person are you gonna be in your dating and love life? Are you gonna be the person who turns from obstacles, who fails to see the potential? Or are you going to be the person who turns obstacles into opportunities? Who sees the possibilities? Who sees the potential for great love? I hope you're that person, and I hope you are open to becoming the CEO and entrepreneur of your dating and love life. All right, stay there, stay there. Let's hear it one more time, Neely Steinberg. Very, very good. Now, my favorite thing that you said is that, is, is that failing over and over again is good. That is good. Failure is an asset. If How you have the courage to look at your failures and learn from them. So that's the part, that's the part where I wonder about, right? Like, cause, yeah. Because 
especially it it strikes me especially failure in the world of like love life can kind of sting in a way that other failures don't right it can it can kind of linger in a way that other failures don't mm -hmm. so how do you sort of how do you do the thing where you you take the failure and learn from it how do you bridge that gap yeah um i mean <laughs> you know, when I was talking about assembling your board of advisors, I mean, yeah. talking and getting it out there and talking about it. I think when you when you sort of verbalize it and you bring it to a place of awareness, I think it's out there and it's sort of a lot easier to kind of work with and move past. Um, because, I mean, you know, otherwise you're just going to be kind of stuck in this rut of feeling like a failure and feeling like you're not good enough and feeling like it's never going to happen for you. But if you start talking, that's the first step. I always like to say, like, take one small smart step in your love life. Breathe and then take another. So for some people, it may just be make the step to start talking with a therapist. Right. Or a small, coach. <laughs> small steps. Yeah. I like that. Um, are the principles that you talk about, are they, are they unique to somebody who is single and out there in the world trying to find a partner? Or are these things that people who are in marriages or in a relationship right now can also sort of apply to their I mean, love I, lives. I wrote the book uh, mostly for singles, but I do think the advice is applicable in that a relationship is hopefully <laughs> always evolving and growing. Um, and, and so if you can sort of apply that mentality to, you know, of commitment um, and, you know, commitment to self growth um, with, in, in this case, within a relationship, um, then yes, yeah, certainly a lot of the a lot of the principles are still applicable. But I, I would say it's more the book is more for singles. But it sounds like this is a good sequel book, right? The book for, <laughs> right? Like book number two. <laughs> uh, you know, it's 21st century. You know, in the last 10 years, dating has been completely upended in terms of the process of it, right? Online mm -hmm. dating, whether it be you know through a website where there's a detailed profile or whether it be through an app where you're swiping through people's faces, like looking at them for half a second and moving on. Right. Um, has that changed any of the stuff that you're talking about? Like, you know, do, do the principles that you're talking about kind of hold true? Or maybe the way I should ask this is like, Give me one piece of advice in the, in the online dating world. It, I mean, it's tough because there are, I mean, it's the paradox of choice, right? There's so many options now that it almost becomes overwhelming. Um, and people, because there are so many choices, people can't make a choice. And, you know, it's almost that mentality of like bigger, better, like, okay, you find somebody who's great, but like, ooh, maybe there's somebody who's even better. And so you keep yeah, swiping. Yeah, and within and like the keep... click of a button, you could find like 6,000 right. more options. Right? I You're remember like, feeling that way. Who live here. I remember wow. feeling that way in my dating life when I was single. It's like I go out on a date, you know, and I have a really good time. And we keep it. But I'm like, oh, wait, there's all these other guys who are emailing me. Like, I have to see what they're all about. And, you know, sometimes that makes sense to keep dating while you're sort of figuring it out. But, but it, it is overwhelming. Um, and what was the other part of your question? I, I guess the question that, all right, so like the, it, that sounds like in your work, you've, you've sort of certainly learned that people are overwhelmed by this. Give me a piece of advice for how to like break through the I'm overwhelmed by this. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would try to, instead of spreading yourself so thin and being on like 10 different platforms, because that can just make you nutty. Um, I would focus, you know, I'd, I like to say diversify your portfolio. So I would say like focus in on like one or two, you know, maybe a couple of different um, platform, so you could have like um, a paid dating site, like a match. I met my husband on Match, so I'm a huge proponent of it. Um, but get onto Match, and then maybe do like a free site or um, you know a, a free app. Um, but a couple of options, but not not doing every single thing that you're hearing about, because then you're you're spreading yourself too thin, and it just becomes you become frazzled. Yeah. Neely Steinberg, everybody, let's hear it for her. <laughs> Who's tried the? Uh Who's tried the uh, VR experience, the biking VR experience? A bunch of you guys. Anybody want to talk to me about it? I want to hear about it. Yeah? Come, just let me ask you a couple questions. I'm sorry, I'm coming down off the stage. What's your name, sir? Uh, Paul Aronofsky. Hi, Paul. Let's hear it for Paul Aronofsky. All right, Paul, what was it like? Um, it was pretty cool. I'm a, kind of an avid biker myself, so it was kind of interesting to see the different things that you could do with it that you can't actually do on a bike. So what things did you just do? Uh, I could drive a tank. I could uh, canoe in a kayak. Um, they said that you could ride a Pegasus like through the air and stuff. Just on the bike? Yeah, yeah, totally. 
Uh, scale of one to ten, ten being this is the greatest moment of my life, one being I will never do it again. Where do you rate it? Um, uh, that would be a solid eight. Solid eight. Let's, wow. I think uh, if you haven't tried it, sounds like it's time to try it. Uh, enough of me. Let's bring another speaker up here. Uh, so, you know, you know, there's like the thing where maybe you guys have a friend like this uh, who's like, oh, hey, man. They tell like some like story about like how them and their friends were like hanging out in this spot and then they went to this bar and then they went and saw this band when they were like 17 and then they're like and that band was like Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band at a bar with like seven people there. Um, you might have a story kind of like that after tonight. Because the thing is, is like I suspect that there's all the chance in the world that this idea of like VR coming to fitness and VR transforming sports from here for the next generation is a real possibility. And tonight you are going to hear from one of the men local to this area who is seriously innovating in this space, who is creating that world that we're talking about. I'm going to bring him up to the stage right now and he's going to share a little of his story and what it is that he does. So please welcome up here the co-founder and CEO of Verzoom, Mr. Eric Jansen. Uh, before I get into talking about Verzoom, show of hands, how many people here have ever heard of the Jobs Act? Okay, we have one couple people, all right. So I want to mention it briefly, then I'll get back to it. So basically what it is, uh, is that until the Jobs Act, if you are uh, an individual wanted to invest in a private company, the theory of the law was if you're rich, you must be smart. Because the only people that were allowed to invest <clears throat> in high return, high risk private companies were wealthy people. So that all changed uh, under the Jobs Act, under the Obama administration back in 19, sorry, in 2014. And the new rules are that you can invest in private companies in proportion to your income and net worth. A bit more common sense. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so, Tony, if you could give me the next slide. So, Resume is the story of two founders who got together to employ a new technology to solve a really big old problem. How many people here really enjoy sitting on a stationary bike and exercising? Nobody. One person. Okay, that's it's kind of unusual, but that kind of tells the whole story. So what we wanted to do is we could, thought we could use VR to fix that. I'm, I'm an avid bike rider, and I love riding bikes. I like being outdoors. I hate being indoors, and particularly don't like being on stationary bikes. So I thought, well, VR could probably address that problem. So we set out to use VR to solve that, uh, and we... The first thing we did was we built a prototype in my co-founder, Eric Malfew's basement in Lexington, Massachusetts, next to the kitty litter box, using his daughter's bike out of the shed, uh, some parts that we got at Radio Shack, literally, and um, we built a prototype, built a little world in VR using a, something called a game engine, and tested this idea. And the idea was that you could do, uh, can you put yourself in an outside world in VR, and it would be so engaging that you would be distracted from the fact that you're sitting on a bike, you're wearing a headset, and you're someplace else. So we test this, and we say, you know, this is definitely going to work. So he gets to work on the, um, on the uh, prototypes and on the IP, and I got to work on raising the money and doing the business plan. So um, this is a case where we set out to do this particular thing to solve this particular problem. But let me explain what I mean by bringing the outdoors indoors. So what's an outdoor uh, sport? We hike, we bike, um, we run. And those are things you think of as exercise outdoors. But what kind of exercise could you do in the virtual world? Well, of course, you could ride a bike. But we also have, as was mentioned before, pedaling a tank or flying a Pegasus through the air. So the fact is that in VR, you can do anything. It's not, it's unlimited. So, yes, you're pedaling a horse over there on Verzoom, and I'd like you to give it a try when you're done. Um, 
So again, the thing we set out to accomplish, which was to make uh, these bikes interesting, we accomplished. But unintentionally, we discovered something else, which was that this new form of exercise that you can do in VR can be extended almost infinitely to do anything. So it wasn't, it just turns out that the right controller to do this kind of exercise is a thing with pedals and handlebars in the seat, which is a stationary bike. So, uh, Tony? So you can do all kinds of things in VR that you can't do in the real world, and you're li really limited only by the imagination of the creators. Our own dev team in Cambridge uh, was run on by my co-founder, Eric Malfew. You know, Eric Malfew was the chief architect on some pretty popular games like um, Guitar Hero and Rock Band, and these are combinations of unusual controllers in a new kind of game, and that's what this is. It's using a bike as a kind of controller for a new kind of VR game that motivates exercise. So the other unintended benefit that we found over time was that you can do this new kind of exercise competitively. So you can have somebody in one part of the world competing in VR from another part of the world. So we have our version systems in Melbourne, Australia, in Singapore, in, in um, Cupertino, right here in Cambridge, of course at MIT, and uh, you can you can comp compete with each other in real time and also asynchronously in tournaments. So in addition to being a new kind of exercise, it's actually a new kind of sport. Now, how are we going to get this to market? So we've partnered with Life Fitness, and Life Fitness is the world's largest fitness equipment company. So they're a billion-dollar-a-year company. And they have a worldwide distribution. And they sell Resume into their, what they refer to as operators. These can be health clubs, Pentagon Athletic Center, uh, hotels, um, anywhere you can think of where there's a fitness center. So I mentioned at the beginning, I asked you a bit about um, the Jobs Act. And the reason I brought that up is I have a bit of a surprise for you. As of about an hour ago, we launched an offering on a crowdfunding platform called WeFunder. So that means anybody here who's listening or in this audience couldn't be part of our story. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. All right, I got some questions. This is great. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the funding thing. How does it work? I, I have to give you $1,000. I can give you $10. What's the, what's the deal? How do, we, how do we become a part of your story? So, uh, Tony, if you go to the last slide, um, what you do is you go to the WeFunder website. Okay. And there's a profile that describes our business and lets you evaluate it as an investment opportunity. And what is, what, is, what, is the thing, what is the thing that you're asking people to fund? Is it the next iteration of this? What, like, what's going to change? What's going to advance? What does my money do? So uh, we, launched, we launched this company in the year 2015, and we had our first commercial product in a year later in June. And we just shipped our newest product, which is sitting over there called VZ Fit, and we launched that last month. So we have a brand new product that incorporates everything that we've learned in the market over the last two years to basically iron out any issues about how it's used, how the customer uses it, how, how fitness clubs use it, uh, and uh, all the pricing issues, all the market frictions have been removed. And then this partnership we have with Life Fitness has also been uh, redone and improved to sell this product more broadly. Take me into the future. <laughs> yeah? Give me, give me an idea of what, what do you see in your head five years from now in regards to this kind of thing? Is it, are people doing it at home? Are they going to the gyms? Like, how, how incredible is the experience? How many people are doing it? Where is it happening? Well, right now we're shipping with a version of this product that has a feature called... Uh, competitions. So they're basically challenges. So the YMCA in Melbourne, Australia, can challenge the YMCA here in Cambridge for a high score. That's pretty so cool. So think about what happens over time yeah. to network effects of all the different YMCAs communicating with each other about, hey, I'd like to join this network of sports with YMCAs, and it begins to grow very quickly. How many miles have you ridden on a stationary bike trying to figure this all out? Well, I definitely do my best thinking when I'm on a bike, so yeah. yes. All right. Do you, Quite a bit. 
Do you still, I assume you still ride your regular bike. It's not a replacement or what? Absolutely. As soon as the weather gets good, I'm out on my real bike. But the difference between now and before Verzoom was around, I would just gain weight in the winter. Because it's the only thing I like doing is riding a bike. So now I Verzoom all winter. All right. Now, this is probably the most important question and maybe the toughest one I'm going to mm. ask you here tonight. You are the CEO and founder of a company that is doing really cool things all over the world. But are you currently the CEO of your dating and love life? Oh, I don't know, not really. <laughs> I, I would have to say that you're, when you're the CEO of a startup, the love life does take a little bit of a hit. But I think that's good news to those of you who are thinking about investing because he's really worried about making your money grow. Let's hear it one more time Thank for you. him. Thank you. Eric Jansen. Thank you. And don't forget, we've got the VR experience over there if you want to try it out for yourselves. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and then we will be back with our final speaker of the night. Who here is confused by what is healthy and what is not, given like what's out there in the world, right? It's confusing. I find it confusing. Anyway, hopefully we're going to walk out of here with a little bit of clarity. So let's welcome to the stage our final speaker of the night, Skylar Griggs. so much everyone it sounds like we have figured out our dating life somewhat yes. <laughs> we're exercising and now we want to figure out what the heck we're gonna eat um, so just by a show of hands just so I know how to gauge this talk who is really into the pumpkin trend right now and who is like so over it like it's September and you're already over the okay okay so that just gives me an idea of how I should gauge my talk tonight. So my name's Skylar Griggs. I'm a registered dietitian, and I work with patients on ways to improve the way that they eat. Um, and so when I was thinking about, you know, the topic I might want to address tonight, I thought, okay, well, what, for myself, what is probably the biggest challenge when it comes to this time of year? And it's a funny time of year, right? Because we went into summer, we were wearing our bikinis, we were looking nice, or bathing suits, or, you know, lots of different functions or things going on, and then we kind of slide into fall, and then into Halloween, and then into Thanksgiving and Christmas, and by the time it's January, you don't know what you had to eat, what you were doing, just trying to figure, figure it all out. So my talk today is on five foods that can keep you healthy through the fall. So the first group of foods I wanted to talk about tonight are cruciferous vegetables. Really, really exciting, right? Does anyone know what cruciferous vegetables are? Spit some out. Throw them at me. Broccoli. Broccoli. Kale. Cabbage. Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And cruciferous vegetables are amazing because not only are they full of fiber, do they keep you feeling fuller longer? And that's a theme you're going to hear me talk a lot about tonight is fiber. Fiber, fiber, fiber. Fiber is like my secret nutrition weapon. Um, and so those foods are high in fiber, but they're also high in antioxidants. They help fight cancer, and they're super versatile to cook with. So one of the easiest ways to cook cruciferous vegetables, just kind of, and we're going to talk about another vegetable after that's very similar, is take things like broccoli, like cauliflower, like Brussels sprouts, when the produce gets really, you know, pretty bleak through the fall and winter, and lay it out on a pan and roast it in the oven. Throw it on 350, 400 for 20 minutes, salt, pepper, seasonings. You don't need to, you know... I think people get very confused and not to go off on a tangent, but you know, it's okay to use a little bit of salt and pepper on your vegetables to make them taste a little bit better. Don't dump the thing on there, but you can, you can season it up a little bit. Um, and so put them in the oven, roast them, do the rest of your cooking. It's something that's really easy. It's a good go-to, especially through the, through the fall and winter months. The next vegetable that I was semi-deciding if I wanted to include pumpkin in this are different types of squashes. So in the fall and winter, we have things like butternut squash, spaghetti squash. We have delicata squash, which is another really nice vegetable for roasting. And by the way, all of these and many of these are available at your local farmer's market. So big on local agriculture, supporting local farmers, and many of these different vegetables are available there. Um, has anyone ever tried spaghetti squash before? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not bad, right? It's something that you can easily mix into sauce or do with ground turkey or ground beef. Um, and, and it's just a nice way to kind of give you some variety going into the winter months. You can puree some squash. You can add it to, you know, into soups or to different types of recipes and sauces. Um, and so that, that'll be my second type of vegetable that, that you could include or type of food that you could include through the fall. The next um, are mushrooms. Mushrooms are like so versatile. They're so easy to cook with. You can chop them up with onions and you can add them to different sauces. You can roast them. You can pan fry them. Um, in, in our house, something that we often do is we'll take mushrooms. I, I buy mushrooms besides the fact that they're packed with fiber. Buy mushrooms every week and I throw them in with tacos. Like you can chop up mushrooms with onions and put it into the ground beef. You can do the same thing with sauce if you have little kids. It's a really, really easy way to add some extra fiber and bulk to your meal. So what is fiber and why do I keep talking about fiber? So fiber is something that's in fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And it should get way more attention than it does. Um, because what it does is it helps to lower your cholesterol if you have it, or keep you at a healthy cholesterol. It helps to keep your blood sugar levels stable. It helps to... Um, it helps manage blood pressure, and it helps you feeling fuller for a longer period of time. Because many people will say to me when they come to see me as patients, they'll be like, I'm just hungry all the time. You know, no matter what I do, I'm just, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And the second I look at their diet, I'm like, what, are you eating any fiber? I mean, there's no fiber in here, and fiber is really what fills you up, gives bulk to your diet. Um, so all, the things that we talk about today include fiber. So does anyone have any of those bags of chickpeas that are on the table right now? Any of those blue bags? Flip it around and take a look at the label of that while we're all here. Um, and yeah, and does, does, is there anything on the label? Are there any nutrition packs on the individual labels? What's the fiber in, in those chickpeas? Six grams. That's actually a pretty decent amount for a small snack. Americans on average need somewhere between 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day. So I have no relationship with this company. I just brought the snack because I think it's a really good example. It also brings me into my fourth food, which are chickpeas. So chickpeas. We like chickpeas, OK? <laughs> so chickpeas, lentils, garbanzo beans, beans, canned beans. Take them out of the can and wash them off. Another great source of fiber and a really good source of protein. Um, the other thing that's really important with fiber, try to always pair it with a protein because it'll make you feel much fuller for a longer period of time. Um, anytime you have a fruit, try to pair that with some kind of protein or healthy fat. That combination of fiber and protein is really what's gonna sustain you. So going back to beans, to chickpeas, to beans, to lentils, to hummus, people like hummus, that's a great food that you can eat through the fall or winter that'll kind of carry you through. Um, and it's a food that I think you know is a good thing to add to your list. The last food that I'm going to talk about that will kind of hopefully take you through these fall and winter months are pumpkin seeds. That's why I wasn't sure whether I should include that or not. Um, so pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds, all great sources of fat, great sources of magnesium in pumpkin and um, sunflower seeds. Magnesium is, is a powerful mineral that, that actually can help in sleep. Um, so pumpkin seeds are something that you could easily add to different salads, different types of mixed dishes. You can add it on top of your yogurt. Um, and I think that they're one of the more underrated snacks. And I feel the same way about you know, some, of the, some of the roasted chickpeas. So takeaway messages that I hope that I can share with you tonight. If I had you know, one or two takeaway messages for you, it would be really pay attention to how much fiber you're eating during the day. Um, try to aim to get somewhere between 25 to 35 grams a day by including those different types of foods. And not to tell you know a total secret, but don't skip breakfast. <laughs> it's probably the worst mistake you can possibly make, and it will leave you hungry for the rest of the day. 90% of the people that come to me for weight management don't eat anything for breakfast. So having a breakfast in the morning, and I would actually have a pretty substantial breakfast in the morning. You say, they say eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. I mean, there is something to that. Um, so kind of spreading, spreading yourself out and doing a little bit more in the morning is, is really helpful. Um, so I hope that I was able to share with you tonight some, some tips on ways that you can um, kind of carry those different vegetables through your fall routine. Um, 
and, uh, and really start looking at that nutrition label, paying attention to fiber. And I hope you stay really healthy this fall. Thank you very much. All right, all right. Stay up here. Skylar Griggs. Okay. Uh, I've had like three boxes of popcorn tonight. <laughs> Um, please tell me there's fiber in popcorn. Is it true? So there is fiber in popcorn. Yeah. Winner. The we butter, all win. I'm not so like sure about lot with or it. A little <laughs> or like some? So so popcorn probably on average, it depends on the brand, probably has somewhere between two and three grams of fiber um, per cup of it. But the great thing about popcorn is that you can eat a pretty decent amount and it's not gonna totally hit you on calories. And I'm yeah, I'm not yeah. a big calorie pusher, but it's not gonna totally break the bank and might give you a little bit of fiber. Okay. All right. I'm into that. I think this popcorn's a little salty, though, yeah. right? I probably. I mean, the butter salt. and the salt probably doesn't help. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> not great. Not great. Um, what are some other foods? I mean, sort of, you know, one of the things I'm struck is about in what you're talking about is like, okay, think about fiber, right? Yeah. So what else besides what you've kind of highlighted are like common foods great that we question. could be maybe like bumping up if we're trying to like up the fiber intake. Yeah, so so the main sources of, of natural fiber are fruits, so edible skins of fruits. Most fruits have a decent amount of fiber. Well, wait a minute, you just said skin, right? That's important. Yeah. I, it's, that strikes yeah. me as important. Like yeah. I eat an apple, I get some fiber. I eat an apple pie. You don't get so much I fiber. I don't get so much fiber because they scrape. I knew all you were going somewhere off, with that. Right? Yeah, <laughs> but, but that's right, right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's in the skin. It's in the skin. So berries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, apples. If you think about it, that's why juice is is really not your friend, right? Because how many oranges would it take to make a cup of orange juice? Eight, I don't know. Ten. I mean, you're losing all of that fiber, right? And that's what fills you up. And, and that goes into a whole, you know, I'm not going to go down that road, but, but th so, so fruits and, and vegetables, um, especially non-starchy vegetables. So every vegetable, excluding potatoes, peas, and corn, are really rich sources of fiber. I was literally like, those are like, <laughs> <laughs> They're not bad. You're just not going to get as favorite. much bang for Come your buck. Then, potatoes, <laughs> ouch, corn, double And ouch. then nuts, seeds, and whole grains. Okay. Uh, you know, sort of as I mentioned, and I saw a couple hands go up when I did this. Yeah. I kind of feel like, I feel like there are, the pendulum is swinging all over the place when it comes to diet and nutrition, yeah. right? It's like, you know, at one point, like, I just saw you do something which, it strikes me, you know, 10 years ago would have sounded ridiculous, which is you said it's a really good source of fat, right? Like yeah, 15 yeah. years ago, 10 years ago, yeah. it was like no fat in your diet. Oh, right, ever. right, right. And you the know, obesity and like, epidemic no carbs started in climbing. Your diet yeah. Ever, yeah. Right? They're all these. Yeah. So as somebody who's in the world, is there is there a trusted source, a place you yeah. go? Do you have some ideas for That's those of us question. who are like navigating all these fad diets that are yeah. being thrown at us to be like, no, 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 where do I go for actual information? Yeah, so I think just on that, I think we did a really big disservice by promoting a low-fat diet because as we know, avocados and nuts and seeds and um, and fish are great sources of fat that are really important for our heart. They boost our good cholesterol. But if I want to know good information about food, I go to the Harvard Health Letter. I go to Nutrition Action, which is a phenomenal, um, unbiased newsletter. Um, I uh, those are probably my two favorite sources: are the, so Harvard, the Harvard, Hel Health Harvard, Harvard Health Letter, and or Nutrition just, Action. Just the Harvard School of Public Health has some great resources online. They're all free, and they provide unbiased advice. Um, and Nutrition Action, which is a newsletter out of D.C. through Center for Science and the Public Interest, that that I view as a pretty good, pretty good resource. And somebody over here is really awesome. <laughs> she must be a nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, could you, is there like, is there like sort of a typical like mistake, like sort of like the biggest mistake people make when it comes to like approaching nutrition? Yeah. Like what I, would you say? Yeah. This? So, so I think, you know, I talked about skipping breakfast and that's probably the biggest mistake that you can make because it kind of sets your body up on this roller coaster for the rest of the day of not eating, your blood sugars drop, and then you eat something and you kind of end up on a roller coaster. So I'd say definitely don't skip breakfast. But the other thing that I think we all tend to do is get very nutrient focused. So, oh, you know, that's that's a good source of vitamin C, so I'm going to eat that, or or that that's too high in fat, or or that's not going to give me enough iron, so I'm not going to eat that. But really, if we do what Michael Pollan says, which is eat foods, mostly plants, not too much we're gonna eat a pretty balanced diet as it is. So maybe taking the focus away from different specific nutrients and vitamins and minerals and really focusing on balancing your plate with real food, you, you're probably gonna get there. All right, uh, what's a good breakfast? 
Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, and yeah. especially, give me a give me a good breakfast for like a breakfast on the go kind of thing. Like yeah. you were saying, like you should have a substantial breakfast. That's great on the weekend totally. when I can like yeah. cook up a whole bunch of stuff and whatever. But I got to get to work. Yep. I want to sleep as long as I can yep. before I have to go to work. What's like a decent on the go breakfast that's like a good way to start your day? So actually a really inexpensive thing that I do is I'll just buy like some good whole grain bread and I'll take either half an avocado or a couple scoops of peanut butter and maybe put, you know, a few blueberries or something like that on top of it. It's that combination of fiber with protein or healthy fat that's going to make you feel full for a longer period of time. So if I have whole grain bread, mm -hmm. which I toast, and put peanut butter and blueberries on, that's You're a good, good breakfast? To go. Yeah. I'm set. <laughs> I know what I'm having tomorrow morning. Let's hear it for her one more time. Thank you. Skylar Griggs. And a big round of applause for all of our speakers tonight who really shone a, a light on a bunch of stuff. Thank you all for coming out. That's it for us tonight.